Good evening or morning, whichever it is for you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the second installment of the Rexus 2020 session on uh, modeling users. And I am Michael Ekstrand. I'm your session chair for this evening. Um, if you've got questions, uh, please ask them in Whova. You're going to need to go to the individual paper. The, the general chat on the right when you're in the session is just a chat to ask the questions, go into the individual paper, put the question in the Q&A, and we will get those to the speakers uh, as we have time for them. Um, if while you're in there, the, the session will stay in a floating window so you won't be losing it. Uh, so we're going to try to keep things going quickly so we can stay on schedule. Our first speaker is... Um, an undergraduate student, Jin Zhao from the University of Toronto, uh, whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, today, I'll be presenting our paper, TAFA, Two-Headed Attention Fuse Autoencoder for Context Aware Recommendations. Uh, this is a joint work by University of Toronto and Layer 6 AI with Joey, Felipe, and Max. The recommendation task we are considering here belongs to implicit feedback. In many cases, interactions such as purchase history or clicks are taken as positive signals, while explicit negatives are missing. It has many practical applications, and sometimes it is the only type of data that's available to us. Collaborative filtering is the standard approach for solving implicit feedback problems. Many approaches have been proposed to tackle this implicit feedback problem, including autoencoders. As the figure on the right shows, autoencoders encode interactions into a latent space through a fully connected layer, and then decode the embedding to generate predictions. While it has strong baseline, it shows strong popularity bias as seen by others and also in our experiments. Uh, user review text, however, has attracted increasing attention as a rich source of site information that can be leveraged to improve recommendation accuracy. It is also very personalized, and we hypothesize it can be leveraged to combat this popularity bias. However, many existing works lack an effective way to correlate meaningful information between user item interactions and reviews Many methods such as autoencoders that only use user item interactions exhibit strong popularity bias. Both limit uh, the general performance of recommended, recommended systems. Hence, our contribution here addresses the two problems by introducing early and late fusion module between user review and interactions to model deeper correlation between embeddings. We also leverage a closed form noise contrast estimation NC objective to combat the popularity bias. Here's an overview of our architecture. As you can see, it consists of a preference encoder that's used to process user implicit feedback, a review encoder that's used to process user review information. Both of them produce a latent representation. The latent representation is then fused in our late fusion module. After that, we have two decoders that we use to decode predictions. Similar to the encoder part of an autoencoder, our preference encoder is a multi-layer perceptron that's used to encode the user item interactions. For the review encoder, a bidirectional ISTM layer is used to produce contextual embeddings for reviews. We apply a tension mechanism on both word level as well as on review level to pick, to pick relevant information both within reviews and between reviews in the review encoder. One main novelty of our paper is we have an early fusion module in the review encoder that takes the preference encoder output, which represents preference for each user, and fuses with individual review of that user. This is in combination with the review level attention mechanism. By doing so, we provide an opportunity for individual review to interact or correlate with user preferences. 
And this also allows user implicit feedback representation to guide review level attention rates. After obtaining the two representations, we need to combine them in late fusion module. Intuitively, this can be achieved with a sim simple concatenation. However, because we have two different modalities, concatenation could be ineffective to capture the correlation between the two representations. We use cross-modal fusion to properly combine the two modalities. Specifically, we first map each representation to a common latent space. The tension is then applied in this common space to fuse the two representations. Fusing with softmax attention has a clear advantage over concatenation here so that the model can explicitly decide how much weight is given to each representation. Uh, lastly, this is our two-headed decoder. The goal here is to mitigate popularity bias while still maintaining good recommendation performance. To do so, we first transform user item interactions to a depopularized version of it. The result of this transformation analytically is the optimal solution for an NC objective. Intuitively, this objective scales down popular item interactions more than unpopular items. For the NC decoder on the left, it reconstructs this depopularized version of user item interactions. This is crucial to mitigate the popularity bias. For the preference decoder, it reconstructs the unmodified user item interactions. We use mean square error as our loss functions for both of the heads, and the sum of the two losses are used to train the model end-to-end. -end. During inference, we use the prediction results from the preference decoder. We evaluate our results on six recommendation data sets that have both user item interactions as well as reviews. Two of them are Yop data set, which are related to restaurant recommendations. The other four are Amazon recommendation data sets, which have diverse domains and also sizes. We order these data set here with ascending sparsity. We use five standard metrics to evaluate the performance of our baselines. Specifically, they are R precision, NDCG, precision, recall, and mean average precision. We compare against five classical recommendations that utilize user item interactions only. We also compare our results with Tarn from Gate to state of the art recommendation methods, then incorporate user review to make better recommendation performance. We show recommendation performance on Yop 2013 and Amazon CDs and vinyls. Uh, the first one is the smallest one, and the last one is the largest and the most sparse one. On both data sets, our method TAFA outperforms other baselines consistently. It can also be seen that the gap between TAFA is smaller for TARMF and GATE compared to other baselines that use only user item interactions, suggesting including the user review information is generally helpful to improve the performance of the model. We also study the level of personalization by our methods. We use the number of interactions an item has as the popularity measurement. Uh, here's the personalization plot for Amazon video games. As you can see, x-axis represents item popularity. A larger value indicates more popular items. We see that Autorex CDAE exhibits strong popularity bias but achieve relatively poor performance. In contrast, other baselines such as GATE and VAE CF mainly recommend less unpopular items, uh, with sharp peaks around very unpopular items. Uh, TAFA, however, instead of being extreme on either end of the popularity spectrum, diversifies recommendation in a more even way and is able to capture user preference for both popular and unpopular items. It can also be seen that we successfully mitigate the popularity bias by other autoencoder methods such as AutoRack and CDAE. Uh, lastly, we visualize attention weights in our review level and word level attention mechanism. We show both types of attention here. The reviews are taken from Amazon Digital Music and belong to the same user. The color represents attention weights with darker color indicate larger attention weights. 
we see that for review one and three, uh, it has focused more compared to review two and four. Since review one and three are more specific, whereas the other two are more ambiguous. For word level attention mechanism, the model focuses on words such as great, favorite, or like that express direct preference. The model is also able to attend to some reasons why the reviewer likes a particular CD, such as singing or dancing. In conclusion, we introduce a method in the implicit feedback setting that mitigate popularity bias uh, by leveraging user review and an NC objective. We introduce early and late fusion module as a novel way to model deeper correlation between user review and user item interactions. Future work will be to extend TAFA by considering other data sources, such as item images, video, and audio. With that, I want to thank you for attention and I'm open to questions. I don't see any questions in the Q&A right now, um, but I have a question. So the, the data you reported on up through the uh, movies and vinyl data set, um, what are the scalability limits on this? And what happens when you go for, say, the books data set or uh, maybe something like the Goodreads review data set? Um, this is definitely a good question. As you can see here, uh, many data sets, they are, uh, for the smaller data set, they have uh, users on the uh, scale of thousands. And then uh, for the largest data set here is uh, tens of thousands. Of course, uh, for books, uh, also uh, larger Amazon data sets, uh, they will be more challenging in terms of how you kind of, you know, train the model because uh, the review or the number of words grow and also the size uh, of the recommendation data sets. Um, we think uh, the more review are generally helpful so that uh, when you go to kind of these large scale data sets, uh, there could be some challenges there because uh, the review or the ratings will get sparser. So uh, things will get a little bit more challenging. A um, uh, question from the audience. Uh, so in practical settings, what are text describing contexts since reviews are obtained after item consumption? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, when we do this uh, inference time, uh, we will not uh, use uh, this sort of uh, review here because we will just feed in the user implicit feedback. Uh, but when we are training this model, we are kind of like letting uh, this model to learn some internal representation that could be helpful when uh, we do inference so that when we feed this sort of uh, implicit feedback representation, it could give us uh, this sort of uh, pr prediction that's closest to uh, the hypothetical uh, correct uh, solutions. Um, yes, uh, this is certainly true that sometimes you have this sort of kind of review after uh, when you are done with uh, kind of purchasing of an item. Uh, so this is something that we can look into to uh, further improve our model. So, okay. Um, I don't see any... Uh, do you have insights on how much the review data actually helps the recommendation? Uh, yes, uh, we actually have some uh, ablation studies on that uh, in our paper. And one thing that's uh, uh, you know, shown here is the level of personalization uh, using review can achieve. So, uh, so basically, if you uh, see here, this is, uh, uh, I think, this model here, which is space plus review, it, it, can, it can actually uh, you know, shift the sort of uh, recommendation popularity spectrum towards the left, which means that the recommendation here is more personalized when you utilize review information. So uh, in that case, the model can recommend uh, items that are more personalized, which could be one of the main factors when you look at kind of, uh, you know, the sort of qualitative uh, recommendation performance. We also have some ablation uh, in the paper that you can go into to see how the performance changes. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, let's move to our next speaker now, who is Scott Sanner, also from the University of Toronto. And uh, go ahead, Scott. Okay, for sure. 
Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Good. Okay, great. So um, this talk is on a ranking op ranking optimization approach to latent linear critiquing and computational recommender systems. That's a long, uh, long title that uh, I'll explain here in the in the talk. Uh, I'm Scott Sanner, and my co-authors are Hansa Lee, Kai Luo, and Guy Wu. And we're all from U of T. Okay, so to, to motivate this work, uh, let me talk. Let me start with a, a, a hypothetical news recommendation crit uh, critiquing scenario from summer twenty twenty to to drive home the idea of language based critiquing. So I say to my new assistant, "Hey, uh, what, what's trending right now?" And the assistant says, "You know, here's some uh, te technology news. Got you like technology, and uh, this news article is about uh, Elon Musk unveiling a brain chip implant. It's like a Fitbit in your skull." He says, "Now you may like that, but." Brain implants worry me, right? So uh, I say to my assistant, uh, is there anything you know, less dystopian in the news? Um, and the system you know, interprets my uh, query correctly and says, sure, here's some, here's some encouraging international news. Okay, this is about uh, progress on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Good, okay, so that piques my interest. You know, what's going on in COVID these days? Uh, so I say, thanks, is there any other interesting COVID news? Um, and the very intelligent system says, uh, not sure if it's interesting, but here's an unusual perspective on COVID-19. And uh, this is when uh, Trump is claiming that the US topping the world virus cases is a badge of honor, certainly an unusual claim. Okay, so what's this work about? It's, it's about language-based critiquing and conversational recommendation. Um, basic loop is repeat until user satisfied, recommend an item, user either says, that's great, I'll take it, right? Or they don't want it and they critique it and they use language to critique. Now there's a lot of great work in uh, critiquing using explicit aspects um, uh, or features of items. And in this case, we really wanna focus on the language-based uh, language -based, language -based aspects. Okay, so this work is really all about critiquing, meeting, embedding-based recommendation. Uh, modern machine learning with language uses embeddings uh, you need to interpret the latent intent of the critiques, for example, less dystopian, like what does that really mean? Uh, and also the, the attributes of news are also expressed in latent. I mean, Reuters probably is not going to label news unusual. At least I haven't seen that label uh, looking for Reuters. So uh, these traits uh, can be inferred, right, from the, from the language, from the text, uh, but they're not always explicit and word embeddings help you with that. Finally, uh, and actually as a later talk in the session, we'll uh, show, um, or as most talks show, uh, late embeddings are very powerful for, um, for modern recommendation systems. Uh, so we have, you know, one key question here, which is we, if we have latent embeddings for the language and latent embeddings for the personal user preferences, right, and the user is giving us feedback and language on these, uh, on what they like and don't like, how, how do we combine, right, the, the latent user preference and the latent critique embeddings? That's a key question of the paper. Um, okay, right, no, right. How, how do we combine embeddings, right, for user preferences and critiques? So we had worked on this uh, a lot in the past year with my group. Uh, the most recent work that we uh, built on here was from the 20. And just to briefly recap what we did there, uh, we, we proposed a linear program to find a good linear weighting of the embeddings uh, that worked better than sort of in, in, in different methods for averaging. Um, and the problem with this method is it, it, it used the LP objective to maximize a score difference between preferred and non-preferred items. And what that really, that maximizing score difference really encouraged extreme weights. Um, and we found that didn't always lead to the best critique weightings. So when we, when we revisit this, this work for Rexis, uh, we want to take a softer, op a softer op optimization approach. And so the whole idea is, if we focus on you know rank SVM style constraints going back, you know over a decade, right? We want to encourage re-ranking of items according to critiques, uh, but only enough uh, perturbation of the predictions to change the ranking, uh, not so as extreme as we were seeing in the in the previous work. So we want to move from score based differences just to sort of re-ranking, and that's the whole purpose of this work. Okay, so let's see. Okay, I'm always running behind. Um, so let me cover the framework here. Uh, let's start with a user item matrix of ratings R. 
And uh, matrix factorization is still quite an effective method. There's a later talk in this session that will uh, discuss that. And so we know how, how this works, right? We get a factorization of a user and then hidden embedding for the user, an item and a hidden embedding uh, for the item. Uh, we can learn this factorization via a number of methods. A uh, method that works quite well uh, in practice is this method from Mitch Kai 16, but use any method you want. Uh, and the whole idea now is that if, if I have a user with item preferences, right, I can now find their corresponding user embedding. Great, that's all historical well-known work. Uh, now let's add in the uh, key phrases that the user is using in this case uh, for the data sets that we have in their reviews. Um, and so now we'd like to get from the language of the users using in their reviews uh, also to their latent embedding. So we have a, you know, a sort of a frequency vector of key phrases or a single key phrase that the user use, uses. We'd like to map that to a latent embedding. Um, how do we do that? Well, it's fairly straightforward here. Uh, we know that whether we get to the embedding from the user item preferences up here, or we get to the user, or we get to the embedding from the key phrase language usage, they should align, right? These, these two Z embeddings should be equal. Um, and so if we fix this set embedding at the one we already learned with the upper matrix factorization and the M is given, right, then we just have to learn this E and just, you know, clearly that's a simple, a simple linear regression problem. Okay, so now we can get your uh, preferences either through your uh, item preferences, so we can get to your embedding, right, your latent preference embedding, either your item preferences or through your language, and these could both co-embed in the same space. Good. Okay, so now we have to combine them, right? You, we have an item, you don't like it, and you critique of the language. We, how do we combine your latent embedding, your preference embedding with the critique embeddings? So for example, if, if, if we're in the, the, the beer domain and, uh, and, um, and you say, I don't want a bitter beer, right? Then we know that bitter beers, known bitter beers, and, and we do know a few known bitter beers because they're labeled as such, uh, they should drop in rank. Um, now, again, we don't assume that everything is explicitly labeled. Uh, and so we're hoping that if we enforce uh, that the known bitter beers should drop in rank that, you know, through embeddings that would generalize to non-explicitly labeled items that many users would also say could be bitter. Okay, so more formally, let's let I plus be the items with high frequency of any critiqued key phrases. These are things that we're pretty sure, right, have the thing we critiqued that should drop. Uh, and let I minus, in contrast, be uh, the low frequency uh, I items that, that really don't have a critique key phrase. And so uh, I plus I minus are very small sets. They're very extreme sets. These are things we know uh, should increase uh, in rank and things that uh, should decrease in rank. So formally, um, we would like the ratings. We have, it, we have different iterations of conversational right, right, recommendation. We have time step T minus one and time step T. And uh, we would like the items I plus to drop in rank Right, these things that were critiqued or known critiques should drop in rank uh, the next iteration t, and the items uh, that uh, should not have been critiqued, right, we're actually going to want these to increase in rank. Now you might ask whether you really want them to increase in rank in a, in, in a experimental evaluation that Honda did actually just last night. Uh, I asked him about this, and he said yes, that we do work better with uh, both constraints included. Okay. And finally, so we have user preference embedding Z. We have all these critique embeddings for all the critiques that have been given over multiple iterations of the session. Uh, and now we have these lambdas to figure out how to weight the different embeddings. Once we have the weighting, we get one joint user embedding for the user and the critiques. And then just for a decoder and the matrix factorization, we can now decode to a rating. So it's just really, how do you come up with these lambdas is the key question. Okay, as I'm running out of time, uh, let me just go very quickly. I won't cover this in depth. We're going to set up it as an observation problem. Uh, maybe the one thing I want to point in the, in the objective is that we kind of default to the lambdas being a uniform weighting. So we're actually going to penalize uh, for our lambda vector deviating from uh, a uniform weighting of, of everything. We found in practice that worked the best. Now, based on the critiques and what we know should drop in rank, or increase in rank, we basically just have a bunch of rank constraints. If you know rank SVM, this is just more or less the same thing, right? You've got just slack variables and so on. 
So that's just Rankin SVM. And voila, we can now solve for weights given our current critiques and the things that we know should change. And we're also going to compare that to two baselines. It, averaging is uh, not the worst thing to do. It works quite well in practice for averaging embedding. So we're going to look at averaging all the uh, user preferences and item critiques together. And we're also going to look at another version that weights the user always one half and everything else uh, equally. OK, I'm going to speed to experiments. We basically run user simulations of critiquing. Uh, you have to read the paper for details. Uh, you know, the, the key result is if we're comparing uh, if we're comparing these averaging methods, we had two methods with this dub dub method that was trying to maximize score differences with our method, which is trying to re-rank based on critiques, we actually see that uh, the, the, the softer re-ranking uh, gives us about a 1.5 to three times performance increase um, across the data sets that we use and across a variety of experimental settings. So overall, the key result of this talk, that you know, the key take home point is uh, in this sort of a critiquing based framework, uh, we found that a rank SVM style approach that kind of gives soft, soft encourages soft perturbations of the predicted ratings uh, tends to yield uh, the best overall uh, weightings for a language based critiquing system. And with that, I will thank you. Feel free to email me any questions, but I'm happy to answer questions online here. One question online so far. Uh, what advantages could this kind of a linear embedding strategy offer to other models? Um, would help to know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very open question. Um, I, I, honestly, I'm not sure how to answer that, but I will say what I like about this. I, 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 I like this idea of, of, of co-embedding. Um, I like the efficiency of the uh, linear embeddings. This PRX system trained at scale. Uh, it was actually developed uh, by a former PhD student of mine at uh, Adobe, and they were they, they were using it at, at extreme scale. Um, so the linear is super efficient, uh, and the idea of co-embedding allows you to take multiple uh, sources of information and co-embed them all in the same space. And um, so the sky's the limit for where you want to apply it. But sorry, if you want to email me the question uh, or more details, I'm happy to answer offline. Um, are there any issues when you want to scale it to more users and longer conversations? Um, more users is not a problem. The, these methods scale uh, quite well. Uh, they're linear. Um, and... Uh, uh, long conversations are are difficult. I mean, you know, a, a, a you probably, in my view, wouldn't have a conversation much longer than ten iterations, which is what we chose as our max in in, in the experiments. Uh, and even then, I mean, how how to combine ten different ten different critiques? Uh, we find the problems a little bit underdetermined, right? Um, so I, I think I think will people have long conversations? You know, before they get exhausted, and and if so, I, I think how you handle so many free parameters, right? Given the relatively sparse data um, is a key question that needs to be answered. Um, and do you track the dialogue states or history for improving the recommendations? Um, the, yeah, that's a great suggestion that uh, came up uh, in, our, in another question on, on Whova. Um, we, don't, we, we don't track anything across a single session. Um, and however, I mean, I, I, obviously there is recent information uh, in, 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 in related sessions uh, from that user and other users that we might want to reuse. So I think that's a great direction for future work. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And we're, we're doing very well at keeping on time today. So uh, next up we have, uh, we have Yin, Yin Zong from, I need to open things up. We have Yin Zong from Texas A&M presenting on content collaborative disentanglement representation learning. Uh, whenever you're ready. Thanks. Okay. So, hi, sorry. So hi everyone, I'm In Zhang from Texas A&M University. Today I'm happy to introduce our work, Content Collaborative Disentanglement Representation Learning for Enhanced Recommendation. 
So in recommendation to predict the user preference towards items, for example, the user preference towards the dress, there are typically two ways. One is to find similar users or similar items, and then based on the similar users' purchase history to predict the user preference towards items. Another is to build the user and item profiles. For example, use the user's age drops information and the dress image description information to build the user profiles and item profiles. Then based on those profiles to predict the user preference towards the dress. Modern recommendations usually consider both collaborative signals and content signals to help improve the recommendation performance. However, the neural features from the two types of information could be highly entangled. For example, if the user prefers the dress because of the dress appearance, high price, and high quality. Uh, and also, there are many similar users who prefer the dress because of the dress appearance and high quality. At the same time, we also want to use the dress image information to help improve the recommendation. In this situation, if we separate consider the collaborative information and content information and directly concatenate the learned collaborative features and content features, the two types of features could redundantly encode the viral characters of the dress leading to the feature duplication and high feature correlation problem. Thus, when both the content and the collaborative information are considered to learn the user preference, uh, it may cause the feature duplication and high feature correlation problem, limits the user and item representation capability, and overweights those correlated features. It can further lead into suboptimal problem and unrobustic recommendation. Thus, in this work, we aim to learn disentangled representation based on both user behavior data and content information for, further, uh, for enhanced recommendation. First, a little bit introduction about the disentangled representation learning. It aims to identify features that are relatively not influenced by the other feature changes. For example, uh, here are some images, and we want to learn the object shape, color, position features that, that are re relatively not influenced by the other feature changes, like the change of the object shape does not influence the object color. And this entangled representation learning has shown robust performance and high interpretability in many areas, especially in computer vision. And one commonly used strategy to learn the disentangled feature is based on the statistical independence. And back to our problem in recommendation, how to learn disentangled features from both content and collaborate information. There are two key unique challenges. First, different from many problem settings that explicit features are known, such as the uh, color shape of the image, the user item interactions does not necessarily map to specific features. Thus, such high heterogeneity between implicit features in user item interactions and explicit features in the content information makes it extremely hard to learn the disentangled features between the collaborative information and content information. Second, the disentanglement between the collaborative signals and content signals only ensures the learned features are different from the two types of information. The features learned when seeing each type could also be highly entangled. Thus, how can we deal with the feature disentanglement when seeing each type of information at a gradual level is also challenging? Consider those two challenges. In this work, we proposed a two-level disentanglement approach called DICER to learn the disentangled features based on both content and collaborative information. And concretely, there are three steps. First, we design a content collaborative disentanglement 
based on the independent marginal distributions to ensure the learned features from each type of information are different from each other. And in the second step, we did the feature disentanglement at granular level to decompose features that are learned when seeing each type. We theoretically show that the learned features when seeing each type are independent with each other at granular level. So in the third step, we design quality colors to ensure the high quality of the learned features in Dicer. Uh, notice here, uh, uh, there are two key variables in our proposed model Dicer. One is ZIC that it represents the content features that is extracted from item content information, CI. And I here represent the item I. Another important variable is ZIO, which represents the content disentangled collaborative features that are learned based on both user item interactions and content information. Uh, okay, let's look at the content collaborative disentanglement first. We design a user feedback XI based on the item feedbacks uh, based on uh, for each item to generate all the uh, to is generated from all the features the I that influence the user preference towards items. Then we decompose the AI to be the content features, the IC, and the content disentangled collaborative features, the IO. Thus, the distribution of the AI can be represented as the joint distribution of the IC and the IO. Then we based on the properties of disentanglement, that is the statistical independent, the joint distribution of the IC and the IO can be uh, represented as their marginal distribution. Then we based on this equation, we can get our, uh, our evidence lower bound of Xi. Then in the second step for the feature disentanglement, we further decompose the KL term in the evidence lower bound. And we have uh, three components as shown here. We analyze the each component, uh, component representations and based on their representations, we reconstruct our final loss function to encourage the feature disentanglement when seeing each type of information at a granular level. Details, please look at the paper and uh, uh, the third step, please look at the paper. So here is the experiment results of our proposed model Dicer compared with the other uh, baselines uh, throughout the three data sets from Amazon. And the last com column data shows the improvement of our proposed model Dicer compared with the other next best performed baseline. And uh, since all the uh, numbers are positive, it shows that the Dicer consistently outperforms state of the art methods in record at K and NCG at top K. And I recall that we have two important variables in Dicer. One is the IC that represents the content features, and uh, the IO represents our learned content disentangled collaborative features. We further visualize the, the, the two learned features. And uh, here is the results. The first figure shows the visualization of the our learned content features. It separates items based. Uh, we can see that it separates items based on item oriented content information. That is, it separates items based on the categories without the category information. And the second figure shows the uh, visualization of our learned content disentangled collaborative features, the I.O., we can see that different from content features, the ZIO can separate items based on the user-oriented information. That is, it clustered items based on uh, females and males usage. usage, usage. Thus, uh, uh, based on the uh, result, we can find that by disentanglement, uh, the learner representations can capture very different information. It increases the capability of the representations to learn variables in uh, various information that could influence the user preference towards item. 
In sum, in this work, we studied the relation between content features and collaborative features. Uh, and then we proposed a two-level disentanglement approach. Uh, by, uh, for, throughout the experiment, we find our learned representations can capture different information and bridge, bring large improvement for recommendation. In the future work, we are interested in extending DICER to other scenarios, such as considering the user social network. That's all. Any questions? Um, so one that came in, uh, could we really consider duplica feature duplication and item cor high feature correlation as limitations since there are techniques to deal with them? Um, so let me check. So here we, we deal with the uh, so here we deal with the feature duplication and high feature correlation uh, based on the uh, based on the marginal distribution here as shown here. For example, the ZIC learned the features from the content information, and then we use the uh, their joint distribution to be re represented by their marginal distribution to ensure the learned ZIO that uh, is disentangled with the content features learned from the content information. Um, I have a question. Uh, so when we're disentangling the content and collaborative features like this, what is going to happen when in like a cold start situation where you have content feed, you have content features coming in, you don't have any collaborative features yet, is it just going to learn the content side of the feature thing? Is there signals that it would have learned from content for this new item that the disentanglement is keeping it from learning that might hurt cold start or, or what's going to happen um, with your model in that scenario? Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, for cold start problems, the content information plays more important roles uh, uh, than the collaborative features because we have uh, few collaborative informations. So here there are two cold start types of cold start problems. One is like we have few collaborative information. Another is we don't have any collaborative information. That is the user of the item is uh, totally new. So the first for the first situations we still can use our method. And we can ensure the learned content features is different from the collaborative features. For the second situation, like we did not consider it here, but it's a very interesting question, and uh, uh, we can uh, do it like for further work. Um, is there anything that keeps this from extending to more than two streams of information, such as if we wanted to do content? and collaborative and reviews like the first paper was doing. Um, could you extend this to three? Is there something that hard codes it to two? Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, yes, definitely it can be uh, extended to multiple disentanglement. So for example, here we can, uh, instead of decompose the, the I to be the two disentangled variables, we can disentangle, we can decompose the I to be the number of uh, uh, informations that, that we need to disentangle, for example, like the reveal to disentangle, we, we can have the three uh, variables here, like the IC, the IO, and the IR that is disentangled with each other. And then we based on the statistical uh, prob uh, independent properties, we can uh, uh, decompose their joint distribution to be their marginal distribution and uh, use similar method as here to uh, learn the disentanglement among those features. Uh, a question on the optimization. What type of variational autoencoder are you using? Uh, uh, Bayesian based variation autoencoder. Yeah. Um. Okay, I think that I think that's the questions that we have. Um, thank you very much, and I think we're ready for our next speaker, who is. Uh, so our, next up, we have, who doesn't like dinosaurs, uh, being presented by Tobias Schnabel. 
from Microsoft Research. Thanks. Um, let me share my screen. I hope, uh, yeah, um, everyone can see that. And then, yep. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, this is joint work with uh, Gonzalo Ramos and Salima Murshi, also from Microsoft. So, whoops. the main goal of uh, recommender systems is to, to connect people to the information on items they want. And um, so it's in, in this kind of picture, recommender systems essentially act as uh, intermediaries, inferring people's preferences and then retrieving items based on those. And for this to work, it is really crucial that the recommender system understands uh, preferences correctly and if not, can be corrected. And so in this paper, we focus on the design space of preference elicitation methods that can uh, be used to inform the recommender system. A very important trade-off to consider when uh, designing preference elicitation methods is the one between how rich the information is that we get uh, versus how demanding it is on users. For example, binary feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down, or liking items is fast, but it is uh, quite limited in the information it conveys about a user's preferences. In contrast, um, conver conversational systems offer rich information, like the ones, for example, we uh, saw earlier <clears throat> in this session, but they pose a high effort on users because they need to type in the like uh, full um, request in, in natural language. So in this work, we explore this design space guided by two questions. First, we ask, uh, what are the patterns in how people express their preferences? And then second, uh, can these patterns help improve recommender systems? And uh, spoiler, um, the answer is yes, but we'll see how later. So to kind of answer this first question, so a question of how people express or what the patterns are, we conducted a need finding study where our goal was really to understand how people articulate their preferences and to distill a general set of patterns um, to organize preferences. And um, in order to do that, we offered people, participants, the full richness of interaction. So we allowed them to draw, annotate, um, gesture um, during, during our interviews so, that, so they could use the full spectrum. The setup was as follows. We didn't, had an in-lab study with 23 participants. And um, the, the, the par each participant went through a curation task on two domains. So we had uh, images and articles, uh, um, 12 images and 12 articles to choose from. And the task uh, for each of these uh, kind of blocks was uh, to, to choose the top three items um, and then for participants to explain their choice. So we contextualized this <clears throat> similar to kind of bookmarking on Pinterest or liking on kind of Instagram for people to kind of uh, perhaps return to that information. And so when people made a choice, we then asked to explain why they made it and recorded their uh, answers. So what did that look like? Well, here are two snapshots, like uh, one from the article creation uh, task where the participant kind of organized it in neatly in kind of uh, overlapping stacks and then labeled them according to the concepts they found in each article. And then in the image creation task, there, that's another participant um, kind of roughly grouping items into themes and then choosing um, among those. And of course, not everyone uh, did, did the same thing, but these are just some uh, examples from this session, so you better understand what we did. Um, we then iteratively coded the answers um, until we arrived uh, <clears throat> at a taxonomy that had sufficient agreement. And each preference statement is essentially coded along two concept dimensions. The first concept dimension is uh, relevance, the question of how a person relates to an item. 
And that could be either through kind of actions, routines, or biases of that person, or if uh, because of attributes, specific attributes uh, that an item has, or people they connect to an item, or um, emotions, imagination, or curiosity. And I'll give some examples uh, in just a second. And then the second uh, concept was uh, the temporal dimension. Like when did this relationship start or end? So it could start have started and ended in the past. For example, memories. Uh, it could start have started in the past and is still ongoing, like background interests. And then it uh, it could also be just happening in the moment or haven't st uh, haven't started yet. So just to show you how we annotated <clears throat> um, preferences, here's one. I love waterfalls, and so that would be relevant because of um, um, a background interest or, you know, bias. And it is something that started in the past and is still ongoing. And then how did you make this where these pieces glued together uh, is something that um, is, uh, is an emotion or, or, or curiosity and is in the moment. So these are how we annotated things. To summarize, and again, more, the whole details are in the paper, so please uh, uh, reference that. But here are kind of the three, I think, most important uh, or most interesting findings and some implications. So we saw that during the kind of curation task, people, many participants showed kind of a two-stage approach where they um, first kind of narrowed it down to a smaller set and then chose among that smaller set. This is also known as consideration set formation in, in marketing. And so an implication could be that uh, we would like, uh, or one should consider supporting um, people in their decision-making more explicitly. And I've uh, done some earlier work on kind of providing people with um, a, an interface component called shortlist that helps them uh, do that. But there's many more um, um, ways to support people. Um, then one difference that we found uh, between the images and article domain is that we had a higher prevalence of emotions and in the moment reactions for images. I think that makes sense intuitively. Um, an implication there would be for better improved design of, of recommender systems is that we should think about considering mm, user generated tags or descriptions uh, when you know, content understanding is not enough to really condense those uh, um, emotional reactions. And then uh, the third um, finding is that, uh, or, or implication rather, is, is that we saw not all um, um, dimensions that we annotated uh, were are currently supported by uh, preference elicitation instruments. For example, the action routines um, R1 um, category is uh, typically not supported. And here the implication would be to add more granularity and support. And this is something that we also explored in the second question, like can these systems help improve recommender systems? And um, what we did here is we carried out a case study where we um, used the patterns and insights uh, from the need finding study to design a, an improved onboarding questionnaire. Our goals were to have less of comparable effort for users and overall yield more accurate recommendations based on that onboarding um, um, questionnaire. So we designed um, a, a survey that we call Tell Why, where we had four questions that uh, capture various factors. And we focused on factors that would generalize or we thought would generalize well. Um, so for example, um, people that you know is probably too specific in order for recommender systems to generalize from that if, if you don't have the, the social network information. And um, yeah, the, like the, the questionnaire is shown on the right um, in more details, uh, the full, full details are in the paper. For the evaluation, what we did is we compared it to other common um, onboarding experiences like a category-based uh, uh, questionnaire, a personality-based one, um, in an item-based one, which is, I think, the most common almost in recommender systems where people um, rate a bunch of items. And um, what we then did is we measured effort via the NASA TLX subscores and then 
uh, recommendation performance via the um, F1 score, where we took the onboarding questionnaire, um, used that as the input X, and then used the uh, is essentially the selected the three items that were selected in the curation tasks at out output, and we deployed this to the crowd, where we got uh, results from or um, input from 518 me mechanical Turk participants, and so uh, on the right are the results. We see that personality-based um, questionnaire onboarding um, performed worse, so it's not to re be recommended. And then tell why it had the highest accuracy and even not sh shown here, we also found that it has a, a comparable or lower user effort. So to summarize, um, the, what are the patterns in how people express their preferences? Well, we propose a coding scheme for a preferences relevance type and temporal dimension that helps you think about how to uh, support people. Um, and then second question was like, how can we use these patterns to improve recommender systems? We show that um, if you uh, you can use them to design a uh, better onboarding um, um, questionnaire where we had uh, demonstrated higher accuracy under lower or um, comparable effort. So on the right is kind of that, that trade-off spectrum of uh, effort and accuracy. And you can see that tell why faults uh, on the Pareto front. And then in future work, we'd like to think about how to use these codes for also explanations back from the recommender and how to do these um, preference updates or, or this refinement in, in a more of a critiquing style fashion where you iteratively um, give feedback. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any questions from online yet, but I'll go with one. Um, so, what were were in the um, in the 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 need finding study particularly or or in using tell why for the onboarding is it focused primarily on the user seeking information for themselves and if yeah. so do you have any thoughts on where it might go what additional codings might arise if we were dealing with a situation where the user is curating resources for someone else. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think uh, what we, for example, had in the questionnaire. Let me go back um, if I can find that. Um, I hope there. So in the in the questionnaire, we, for example, ask goals I have currently: um, live greener, budget smarter, eat better, exercise well, like learn a new language. And I think those are things you could ask on behalf also of someone else. Uh, as well as kind of things I find inspiring, activities I like doing, qualities they like. Depends then on how how uh, specific you can answer those questions for someone else. And so you might want to um, ask also in addition maybe about some uh, some things that um, uh, are are more coarse or replace some of these specific uh, things. And again, um, because that was a question that came er uh, up also earlier, when you want to adapt it to other domains, clearly um, those same uh, um, values or instantiations wouldn't make sense. But I think nevertheless, the coding in itself, we try to keep as general as possible so that it still aligns. Let's say you want to go to uh, buying, buying a, a product, then you would think more about, let's say, the item attributes. So you would support that category better. But I think still um, that, that yeah, it, it is, is like a useful way of, of thinking about which things might be missing from current um, elicitation instruments. Um, question, can you give some examples of tell why what questions were actually asked in the method? Oh, um, yeah, so we asked uh, goals I have currently. We asked things that I find inspiring qualities I like and activities I like doing. Um, again, those were kind of uh, mapped from kind of the, the concepts that we had earlier, and then we reframed, rephrased them to make them more um, uh, user-friendly, essentially, and more engaging. And uh, the details are like how, how they exactly connect that's, that's uh, in the paper. Um, 
And there's certainly other designs that were possible, but uh, that that was like a very straightforward way for us to to to, to map map some of the concepts into um, um, actual questions. And people could choose one or multiple um, options here. Um, and you could certainly think about you know different UIs as well, like you know uh, where you can um, tag things uh, or select multiple just with a tap or so. So it's it's not necessarily that shape or form. Okay, um, I think we're right at time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank and, you. And um, our next speaker is Walid Krishane from Google, who's going to be talking about revisiting neural collaborative filtering and matrix factorization. Take it away. Hi, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Walid Prishan, uh, and uh, this is joint work with Stefan Randler, Li Zhang, and uh, John Anderson. And uh, I'll start by saying that this is a reproducibility paper, so the focus here will be slightly different than the rest of the papers in the talk, uh, in the session, sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so a general approach for training item recommendation models is to learn uh, an embedding representation for users and items, then combine these embeddings using uh, what's called a similarity function. Uh, one simple example uh, for similarity functions is the dot product. For example, when the embeddings are free variables, this would correspond to matrix factorization. Um, and uh, the embeddings themselves could also be learned functions, for example, mapping user or item features to the embedding. Uh, in this figure here, we have a first neural network mapping user features, for example, to user embedding, and a second neural network or encoder on the item side. Now, some recent work has advocated for replacing the dot product by a learned similarity function. Uh, one example, the simplest example, is to concatenate the embeddings P and Q and then feed them into a multi-layer perceptron, or MLP for short. Um, this approach is often referred to as neural collaborative filtering, or NCF, in reference to this paper by uh, He et al. from WWW 2017. And uh, um, mainly two arguments have been used in support of this approach. One is the experimental results from this paper, uh, and two, the universal approximation theorem, which states that a large enough MLP can locally approximate any continuous function. And in particular, it should subsume the dot product. And as a consequence, MLP learned similarity has become the de facto standard in many academic studies, and it's uh, often cited as a strong baseline. Um, so in this paper, our goal is to revisit these two arguments and show that they are both flawed. So let's start by revisiting the NCF experiments. Um, our setup follows that of the NCF paper. Uh, we run experiments using the same published code and the same training procedure uh, on two data sets, MovieLens 1 million and Pinterest. And the protocol uh, is to hold out one item per user. Um, and then after training, we measure sampled recall and NDCG at 10 uh, with a sample size of 100. Uh, again, to follow the, the same procedure as the NCF paper. And the models we compare are uh, a matrix factorization a model, which is our baseline, and then the NCF variants from uh, the paper. And it's worth mentioning that in all of these models, the embeddings P and Q are free model variables. So really the only difference um, is the choice of similarity function fee. Uh, again, the training procedure is the same. Um, so any differences that we observe, we should be able to attribute to the choice of similarity function. In, in these figures, uh, the x-axis corresponds to the embedding dimension, and the y-axis is the metric. Uh, the left column is uh, hit ratio or recall, and the right column is MDCG. Uh, the top row is movie length, and the bottom row is uh, Pinterest. Um, so in these first set of figures, we compare the matrix factorization baseline to the MLP learned similarity. Uh, dot, uh, so the dot product or matrix factorization is in blue. And as we can see, the dot product outperforms uh, MLP learned similarity. Now, there are other variants that were proposed. For example, one variant is to do MLP plus uh, GMF, which is generalized matrix factorization. 
so basically, this combines MLP and dot product, where two thirds of the embedding is used in the MLP and one third of the embedding is used in the dot product. Uh, so here it's generalized in the sense that there are weights that are also learned. So this uh, improves upon the previous MLP, but uh, it's still worse than the simple dot product. And the final variant is to, you, to uh, use the same model, but to pre-train the individual components and then fine tuning the combined model. And there's, this again improves uh, on the uh, sort of the model that's trained from scratch, um, but um, still, um, you know, um, is still outperformed by the simple dot product model, except in one uh, data instance, which is here. Um, here, I should mention that dot product was used as a baseline method in the original NCF paper, but it was find, uh, found to have poor performance. Uh, however, what we show is that carefully tuning the baseline actually outperforms all of these NCF variants. Uh, this could be attributed to the difficulty of setting up baselines as um, argued in many papers, including these two. Uh, one was, uh, uh, I believe, the best paper award at Rexis last year. And, um, you know, these revised results show that there is uh, no empirical evidence, um, at least in these experiments, in favor of NCF. Now let's look at the second argument, which is um, the ability of MLP to learn that product. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's argued that a large enough MLP is able to locally approximate any continuous function. Uh, so it should subsume dot product models in particular. Here, we um, sort of investigate this question empirically. We run some synthetic experiments uh, to, show, to find out how difficult it is to learn a dot product using MLP. Uh, specifically, we want to know how large the MLP needs to be and how many training examples are needed. Um, the setup is as follows. Uh, we generate embeddings from a normal distribution, and then the labels are given by the dot product plus a noise term, which is also normally distributed. And then we choose the variance of these two distributions in such a way that they align with empirical measurements from the Netflix price, uh, just to have a benchmark uh, to have some guidelines on what should be considered a significant approximation error. Uh, in particular, it took more than a year for the community to improve the RMSC by 0.01, so we consider this to be a quite significant difference. Um, in fact, even smaller increments have been published in the past. And so this number 0.01 .01, corresponds to this green line here uh, on the plots. So an approximation error above the line, uh, we would consider too high. Uh, the x-axis in this figure is the number of users in the synth synthetic set. Uh, and the solid and dotted lines basically correspond to cold start versus warm start uh, test set. Um, and finally, the different colors are different embedding dimensions. So blue is the smallest and red is the largest. We also vary the size of the MLP itself. Uh, of course, as we increase the size, we will achieve a lower approximation error. This was the size that, that was recommended in the NCF paper. Um, however, the error remains quite high. Uh, but even if we increase, here we doubled and then we, um, uh, we quadrupled the size. And, uh, you know, for most uh, embedding dimensions, except the smallest one, uh, the error still remains very high. And also the number of examples that is um, required to achieve this low approximation error grows somewhat quadratically in the embedding dimension. So beyond these experimental results, there's also a practical advantage of dot product that, uh, uh, you know, uh, one should keep in mind. Uh, which has to do with retrieval. Uh, so retrieval can be done efficiently for dot product. Uh, there are approximate inner product search techniques that um, a priori don't apply to MLPs. Um, and even if we were to do exact scoring uh, for retrieval, the cost of scoring under dot product would scale linearly in the embedding dimension, and under N MLP it would scale quadratically. Uh, so this would also make it impractical for a very large scale. So in light of these empirical results um, and practical advantages, we in general prefer using dot product over learned similarity. Um, and I'd like to emphasize that this is not a statement about um, whether neural networks are useful for recommendation. Um, rather, this is a statement about the similarity function itself. 
uh, that's used to combine the embeddings. Again, embeddings could be, for example, the result of an encoder. Um, in fact, many neural networks use dot products. Uh, for example, in a softmax model, if you're using a softmax model, if P is uh, the input to the softmax layer and Q is the weight matrix, then the i logit is simply the dot product between P and the i throw QI. So to conclude, um, this work compared similarity functions uh, for recommendation and showed that a carefully tuned dot product um, baseline outperforms learned similarity models. It also showed that in practice, learning a dot product of the MLP would require a very large model or um, very large uh, data set. So we think that NCF similarity should be used with care uh, and that dot product is likely a better default choice in most cases. Thanks for listening and uh, I'll take any questions. Oh, sorry. I, I think you are muted. I'm not hearing you. Sorry. I'm muted. Okay. Uh, is the implication that here that the true similarity function is linear in the embedding space and are the embeddings themselves linear with respect to the one hot space? Um, so I, I don't want to say that there's uh, that the ground truth itself is, is linear or I guess bilinear in this case since we're, we're taking dot products. Um, Maybe one way to say it is that the ground truth is closer uh, to be represented by a dot product. <laughs> uh, and of course, this could vary uh, depending on applications, right? So there might be some applications where, uh, uh, where an MLP would be better. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, what's clear is that the argument that MLP subsumes dot product is, is not true because you cannot recover the performance of a dot product model. And even on synthetic data, it cannot learn the dot product. Um, so do you have insight, you, you mentioned it being, uh, there might be context where it's better. Do you have insight, any insight into what those contexts where MLP might be better are? So um, to, be, um, to be honest, we haven't uh, found applications where an MLP is uh, significantly better. Uh, in some cases, it might be, you know, comparable uh, to a dot product, uh, but it is also harder to tune. It's possible that this is simply because we have more experience with dot product. Uh, but uh, so another argument that was made for uh, MLP is that it's able to learn um, um, non-symmetric uh, relationships. So if you have some reason to believe that there's a, um, you know, there's no symmetry in your data set, um, then perhaps an MLP can provide some advantage. I should also mention that there was another talk earlier today, um, I forgot the title, but that also made a similar uh, empirical ex um, observation that the uh, dot product in their case as well was um, uh, performed better than MLP. Um, from the, the replication paper process, do you have uh, thoughts or insights in how to uh, do future work that will withstand this kind of detailed probing, or is more likely to at least? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think we have, uh, we have sort of a perfect solution for this, um, but I think part of the solution might be to have uh, a more systematic benchmark instead of uh, mostly one-off evaluations. Uh, so in many published results, um, you know, even though many papers use movie lens, let's say, um, there are slight variations in the evaluation protocol that make it very hard to compare the numbers. Um, for example, you know, in some cases we hold out the last item, in some cases we hold out random subset of ratings, in some cases, we measure exact recall. In other cases, we measure sampled recall. And uh, I think having sort of a centralized uh, benchmark um, might help with that. Um, because even in, let's say, let's take the Netflix prize example, right? So it took the community many, many years, uh, even though the, the, you know, the latest, the, the best models were simple models like matrix factorization models. Uh, it, it took a long time uh, to get 
to the best to squeeze out the best performance of those simple models. Um, which is to say, again, that tuning a simple baseline might be difficult. Thank, thank you very much. Um, sure. And we have, uh, I don't see any more questions in Hoover right now. So I think we're now ready for the last talk of the session on query as context for item to item recommendation by uh, Mumita Bhattacharya from Etsy. Uh, whenever you're ready. I think it was muted. Okay. Hey everyone, I'm Amita Valcharya, a senior applied scientist at Etsy. And today uh, I'm excited to present uh, our work. This is an industry uh, industrial uh, track talk, um, query as context for item to item recommendation. This is a joint work with a colleague of mine in Etsy, Amaya Barapathra. So uh, in, the, in the context of um, uh, real world problems, specifically uh, in platforms like Etsy, which is a two-sided marketplace, one of the major applications of machine learning is uh, recommendations, of course. We have been talking about recommendations a lot. Um, and one main application in the context of e-commerce is also item to item recommendations, where given a product page a user is at, we want to show the user some additional products that we think the user might also be interested in. And here's an example where given this target uh, item, which is a beautiful vase, we want to recommend additional uh, colorful uh, glass items that the user might also like. Traditionally, such item to item recommendation models are, uh, recommendations are typically generated uh, using characteristics and properties of the item itself. So for example, the color and the descriptions or uh, uh, historical interactions with these items are information that are used to generate these uh, modules like you may also like. So, how we go about it uh, in our current system was uh, we build a content-based recommendation model where given this target item, we extract uh, attributes of features uh, using things like titles, description, ratings related to this item, reviews, uh, historical information such as clicks and favors, dwell time, and then used implicit feedback from historical visit logs to generate labels and trained a machine learning model to uh, optimize for some kind of probability, um, uh, some kind of objective function, in this case, uh, probability of user engagement or purchase, purchasability of the item. However, uh, as you noticed, uh, we do not really add any additional context uh, in such item to item recommendation um, more commonly. So uh, also in, in reality, to generate such machine learning models, it's difficult to uh, get these recommendations across all the items present in the platform, specifically in context of Etsy or other e-commerce platform, there are many, many, many listings. We have six, more than 65 million active listings to generate uh, scorings and rank list of recommendation for all the 65 million listings, we'll have to calculate uh, 65 million by 65 million competition, which is a competition pretty infeasible. So in practical se setting, we divide this task in two stages. In the first stage, given a target item, we try to retrieve with high recall uh, from off the millions of listings, some hundreds of listings that are relevant, uh, that might be relevant to the given target, and then use a second pass ranker um, or machine learning model to rank those hundreds of listings to generate the final recommendations. The first stage is called candidate generation often, and the second stage is um, similar to the ML model that I was showing in my previous slide often referred to as second pass ranker. In this study, um, in this project, we uh, generate a new kind of set that incorporates additional context, uh, specifically context around uh, user intent and seasonality in the form of queries to uh, generate a new kind of set. And how do we go about it? So uh, as I was mentioning, the uh, hypothesis we try to test is, can we include context beyond just the attributes or characteristics of the associated target item and recommendation items, rec uh, candidate items? For example, given this red hat, say it's Halloween time, which is actually it's coming, uh, Halloween is coming up. The question we try to answer is, of course, very simplistically, whether we should show these, the top three red hats, which are generic red hats, 
or should we show red hats that are more Halloween specific? And if we, it's more relevant to show red hats that are more Halloween specific, how do we do that? And how do we do that at scale? That's the question we try to answer with this project. For, for uh, answering this question, we propose two approaches. The first is using embedding-based um, embedding nearest neighbor approach. So essentially, uh, we uh, use top end queries associated with each item and using the word item, product, listing interchangeably. Given, these, uh, given we know these top end queries from historical visit logs associated with each item, we also gen uh, train an embedding model. Uh, in this case, we trained a simple skip gram model using a query and listing which can give us uh, query embeddings and listing embeddings. Now, given these uh, inf inferring the query and listing embeddings, for each query, we calculate uh, in the listing space nearest neighbors that, um, that can be identified uh, given the embeddings. So we identify a K nearest neighbor given the query in the listing space. And for uh, the K nearest neighbor, we use a FIAS API. So now we have two components. We have top end queries associated with each, each listing. And uh, given each query embedding, we have uh, K nearest neighbors in the listing space. This enables us to essentially get candidates for each listing via the query. So basically, instead of directly going from listing to listing, we go from listing to query and then to listing to obtain uh, item item similarity um, candidates. However, we found that from our offline evaluation, which I'm going to present in a few slides, that uh, these, um, this particular approach was actually outperformed by a much simpler approach, which was instead of using uh, these embeddings, uh, we basically kind of relied on our search sessions. So here is an example of a search session where given this, for example, this query hanging shelves, we pick each item uh, as a target item that was rendered as by our search algorithm and looked at co-interacted items. So given this uh, top item uh, as a target item, we looked at all other items that were clicked or added to cart or purchased during that search session and added and incorporated them as candidates and then aggregated that across all search sessions. And we did that for multiple days and the number of days across which the aggregation happens is kind of a hyperparameter for our approach. This yielded for each target listing um, candidates that are collected as neighbors within the search session, while also incorporating um, user interactions from historical logs. And we found that from our offline experiments, we found that this approach outperformed the previous nearest neighbor based uh, embedding uh, approach. Once we have these two candidates from these two approaches, uh, we then used a, a nonlinear model, specifically a gradient booster decision tree, point-wise ranker to rank the list of candidates that we obtained. And the ranker was trained on uh, aggregate implicit feedback from a recommendation module uh, while treating the task, in, task at hand as a binary classification task, where uh, click and purchase was treated as positive class and uh, impression and view was treated as negative class. And as one would imagine, uh, and which is commonly a uh, issue, our training data was highly imbalanced. And we treated the class imbalance um, in using two approaches. One was uh, downsampling the negative class or the majority class. And uh, second was instance weighing uh, different um, class labels. And both, uh, both these approaches actually yielded uh, reduced training time and improved the performance. Uh, we also experimented uh, with uh, pairwise ranking for this particular task, though uh, pointwise start uh, ranking gave superior um, offline evaluation values. How do we evaluate this kind of sets? Um, so we use a few different, uh, developed a few different um, evaluation metric and also used a common uh, metric uh, for uh, evaluating kind of set. The first one was hit rate, uh, often known, also known as re uh, recall. For a given target listing, all the co-clicked listing average over the visit was uh, used to calculate the recall value, which is true positive divided by true positive plus false negative. For each item or product, we also have a taxonomy path associated. So for example, for a, a table lamp, the taxonomy path might look like home, home and living, then lightning and uh, table lamp. 
uh, for each for given two listing, we calculate taxonomy distance um, based on this equation, simple equation shown here. Essentially, is the union of the taxonomies between the two listings um, divided by the intersection. And that gave us uh, some kind of sense of how similar the candidates are given a target listing. We also use additional evaluation metrics such as uh, mean average log price and standard deviation of log price, average unique taxonomy unique uh, and unique number of shops. These two um, metrics also uh, uh, indicated, how, indicated how similar the candidates are uh, given the target. And our aim was to uh, make these values as close to the target listing. So essentially we wanted our candidates to converge closer to the target because that was the task in hand. For a module, uh, for an item to item recommendation module, we want our candidates or recommendations to be um, closer to the target item because the product um, requirement is that we want to show similar items to the user because the user has shown some interest in the current product page they are at. We also evaluated some additional metrics such as average number recommendation and coverage to kind of, um, if, uh, assess the efficacy of our method. So given all these evaluation metric, uh, how did our offline numbers look? Uh, essentially, our, uh, we, we saw that our method, um, the new candidates said the winning approach uh, yielded a superior uh, offline numbers for uh, compared to the production system. Specifically uh, for recall, we saw 12%, more than 12% uh, improvement. Taxonomy distance, um, we saw improvement. And uh, again, the improvement here was the lower, uh, lower value is better. So we saw an increase in similarity between a target listing and candidate listing. And the price, uh, on an average, the candidate price was similar to the target, uh, pri pri target pr item price. Um, uh, using this new approach, we also launched several A-B tests uh, because this, was, um, this approach was developed as a, a real application uh, which arose from a, a product need. We launched uh, this item-to-item -item similarity across uh, multiple pages in the platform, uh, including uh, the product page where uh, uh, traffic came from paid traffic or signed-in user and signed-out user, as well as uh, additional pages, pages such as cart page and post-purchase page. We found significant improvement in um, multiple um, A-B test metrics, including conversion rate and um, increased uh, user engagement, which also yielded uh, uh, a significantly high GMB value. So to conclude, we showed that adding additional context, uh, contextual information beyond that is captured um, just by the attributes and characteristics of the listing yielded um, an improved set of item to item recommendation model. Uh, we also developed a few evaluation metrics to assess the efficacy of these kind of set. And we have hypothesized that these um, additional evaluation metrics can be used beyond just the use case presented here. And due to the uh, positive indications from the several A-B tests that we ran, uh, we currently are continuing this track of work, including um, as a part of future work, we are including query as context as our feature for second pass ranker. We are adding additional personalized um, context in such item to item recommendations. Thank you, and I can take any questions. Thank you. Uh, so one question, um, what are the main features taking into account doing the item to item recommendation and what could the most important, uh, what could the, the written, what could the most important question take into account? What could be the most important question taken into account? Um, I don't <laughs> fully understand that question. I'm reading the questions from the text. So, no but, uh, <laughs> yeah, what are the main main features taken into account uh, when doing the item to item recommendation? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so for the second pass ranker, um, we include uh, tons of features. I think in total there were 180 features. Um, some of the highlighting features are we do use uh, cosine similarity between the target item uh, descriptions and titles and um, candidate items. We use features such as um, price related features and additional uh, distance between taxonomy parts. Uh, that's for the second pass ranker and which uh, was used to train, um, we use a GBTT ranker for training it. And uh, I, I guess I can, I can answer offline and look into what are features, but around 200 features was used. Okay. Um, did you compare Light GBM with XG Boost and any reason to choose Light GBM? Yeah, so there was this whole 
one quarter we looked at different APIs when uh, latency and performance and uh, concluded that LightGBM in our context was performing better compared to XGBoost. Uh, did you look at any list-wise approaches for ranking? Uh, in the past, we have, but for this context, we just looked at pairwise and uh, uh, pointwise and pairwise. Um, and then, how do you obtain false negatives in the evaluation set for hit rate? Are they randomly sampled or nearest neighbors? Uh, they are randomly sampled. So they are. We take the whole set and then downsample from the negative class. Um, and then we're almost done. I have one question. Um, the So you're doing the two-stage ranker approach here, which is common in IR. It seems very common in industry things. It's not something that shows up almost at all in the academic recommendation literature. Yeah. Do you have any insight into why and to what might change about the way we're doing academic re uh, recommendation research if we start to look at the, uh, the two-stage ranking approach? Yeah, I think my insight would come from why I've not been able to use a one-stage ranking in industry. I think that we can then reverse engineer and think about uh, it differently, but it's really hard in real production system to use a very fancy second pass ranker and then say, let's throw in 65 million listings and get ranking for all of them, especially when the ranking and the recommendation is generated in real time. So in this context, let's say when a user comes to item product page, we then want to generate the list, a uh, ranked list of recommendation. And if we did not have a store set of can candidates for this particular item, which is in the space of hundreds and not millions, then it's almost computationally infeasible for us to, uh, in, in real time with reasonable latency to generate those recommendations. So that's why I think in the case of industry, we need almost, it's almost essential to have a two stage where four stages, a retrieval stage where we are trying to maintain good enough recall. And the second stage is when we are thinking about the precision that we should show the first item that is most relevant according to the model first and then the second item and so on. Okay, uh, thank you very much to all of our speakers. Um, we're out of time now, but uh, the, I encourage you to keep asking questions in Whova and for the, the speakers to go and uh, take, a ch take a look at the questions that uh, we didn't get to live and have a good rest of your Rexus. Thank you.